Hello, my name is Joseph Shulam. I am the Director Emeritus of Bible Instruction Ministry in Jerusalem. Nativia was started some 50 years ago, and we've been doing radio for many, many years. And now we're beginning an adventure together with Brad TV to do 54 recordings of the Torah portions and the uh, sometimes also from the prophets that are read in every synagogue around the world. Jewish synagogue and many messianic synagogues as well. So we're embarking in a journey that will start around Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish traditional New Year in Korea. I'm sorry that I don't speak Korean and that I will have to speak in English, uh, but I'm sure that our brothers in Brad TV will do a great job with the subtitles and you will be able to follow. We're starting with Genesis. And uh, the Jewish synagogues have, from the earliest days of the construction of the synagogues uh, during uh, Babylonian exile, reading the five books of Moses and the counterpart text in the prophets. And of course, as disciples of Yeshua, we're going to add also the New Testament text. And this is the first lesson, starting with Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And uh, it's, the Bible starts with seven words in the Hebrew. Bereshit, bara, Elohim, et hashamayim, ve'et ha'aret. Seven words. Do you think it's an accident? I don't think it's an accident. But this is the most important verse in the whole Bible. Everything in our Bible and our faith in God hinges on this one verse. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If this verse is not true, nothing in the Bible is true. Because if we don't live on a planet Earth, and in this galaxy with the sun and the moon and the, the, the stars in our galaxy were not created by God, then the Bible is fake news. And nothing in it is to be trustworthy. I'm repeating this point because I believe it's a central point. If this verse is not true, then everything in our Bible is not to be trusted. It's a serious thing. But how do we know that something is true? It has to have evidence. 
And sometimes it's very, very complex and difficult to find evidence for such a big move. And a few years back, I read Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time. Stephen Hawking is an atheist. He's not a believer in God. But in his book, he affirms these two basic truths that come from the Bible. There was a time in which the earth and our galaxy did not exist. I'm going to repeat that statement. There was a time, according to the most honored and renowned physicist in our uh, generation, there was a time in which the earth and our galaxy did not exist. And there will be a time in which we don't know when, how long, maybe hundreds of thousands of years, maybe millions of years, there will be a time in which stars and galaxies die and our galaxy and our earth will cease to exist. Well, Stephen Hawking's is not exactly evidence, but it's an interesting kind of sliver of evidence. However, I think that there is evidence. Where does this evidence come from? It comes from more ancient literature than our Bible. Sumerian, Babylonian, South American Indians, North American Indians, Indian Indians from India and from, from other sources as well, ancient sources, most of them older than our Bible, like Egyptian sources. Of course, I am not teaching now in the university. I want to inspire you, first of all, to encourage you to read your Bible from the beginning to the end. Not a verse here, a verse there, like the pastors in the churches that give sermons, they pick from here, they pick from there, but it's seldom done in order from Genesis on to Revelation. But the apostles in Acts chapter 15, when they gather together in Jerusalem to discuss what to do with the Gentiles, and uh, we Jewish disciples of, of Yeshua, of Jesus, were very kind. We said, we don't need to circumcise them. They don't need to be circumcised. But they need to do what God commanded Noah long before Abraham and long before Moses to do to abstain from sexual immorality. Where did they get that from? Chapter 9 of Genesis. To abstain from gender, uh, sexual immorality because there it says that uh, they should multiply and and, and fill the world, fill the earth with children. Then to abstain from eating blood and to abstain from shedding blood. These three commands are from Noah, chapter 9 of the book of Genesis. We'll get to it soon. And the apostles said to the Gentiles in Acts 15, that they need to keep these commandments. They added another one, they interpreted another one based on the eating issue, and that is not to eat meat strangled, in other words, meat which is not slaughtered right by cutting of the throat and bleeding. The heart is still pumping, blood, the blood is, is spewed out, and uh, that we shouldn't eat blood, we shouldn't shed blood, and we shouldn't participate in pornea in Greek, which is immoral sex. We get the word pornography from there. The next thing that the apostles commanded the Gentiles in, that became believers in Jesus and believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is to go to the synagogue where every Sabbath the word of God is being read. That custom of reading the Bible publicly, in originated 
in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. Whoever wants to know the day, the time of the origination, we have it in the book of Nehemiah chapter 8. The people came from the exile, they had forgotten the Bible, they had forgotten the Word of God. Seventy years, more than a generation, they stayed in the, in, in the New York of the ancient world, Babylon. And they uh, forgot, forgot some of the language, forgot the Bible. And therefore, Ezra and Nehemiah gathered the Levites and they read the Bible publicly, the whole five books of Moses, all morning long till the late afternoon, publicly. And the people gathered around that big wooden platform and pulpit that they built so that the people could hear. And uh, so the apostles recommended the Gentiles to go to the synagogue. Why? Not everybody had an iPhone or an iPad or a book, uh, a Bible that was available to him. Bibles were very rare. Even the five books of Moses were very rare. And only synagogues, only rich synagogues had the whole five books of Moses. It was copied by hand on leather, just like our Torah scrolls today in every synagogue. So back to Genesis. So Stephen Hawking's book and his opinion is not evidence. But what is evidence? We have ancient creation stories that sometimes like the Enuma Elish from Babylon uh, includes also the flood, Noah's flood. And it predates our Bible by nearly a thousand years. Let me read to you from what is called the Enuma Elish. We have several Babylonian myths of, uh, of creation. And, uh, but the Enuma Elish is one of the older ones. And it is uh, something that is evidence, in my opinion, of the veracity, the truthfulness of the story of Genesis, of the creation. Now, scholars today say, since the Enuma Elish was older, then the book of Genesis took information from the Enuma Elish and from the Gilgamesh and other ancient Middle Eastern myths that include elements of the creation and appropriated them in our Bible. Well, that is interesting, but it's not true. Why isn't it true? Because we have about 30 ancient creation stories. I said we have from the northern European area. We have from American Indians. We have from South American Indians. We have from Indian Indians. We have from, from very old cultures like China and Egypt. Creation stories, and they all have similarities. The similarities are important and the differences are even more important. But let me read you. I'm reading you from the first verses of the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian Sumerian creation myth. Divine spirit and cosmic matter are coexistent and co-eternal. Primeval chaos. Tiamat. Tiamat is the goddess of the abyss. The Egyptian and Middle Eastern Babylonian. Tiamat enveloped in darkness. Light emanating from the gods. Creation of the firmament. Creation of dry land. Creation of the luminaries, I mean the stars. Creation of men. The gods rest and celebrate. This is the opening statement of the Enuma Elish predating the written Bible that we have today. 
very great similarities, folks. And great differences as well. First of all, the similarities. Light emanated from gods, from the gods, from the idols of these pagan nations. There was the firmament created, the heavens created. And also the dry land was created. And also the luminaries, the stars were created. And also man was created. Very similar to the first chapter of the book of Genesis. And I could bring you many, many more ancient documents that have the same similarities. In other words, we have witnesses that are not connected with each other. Far geographically, far culturally, pagan, believe in many gods that have similar stories that our world was created by the gods. That similarity is important, but the difference is even more important. The difference is this, that the Bible speaks of one God who's the creator of everything. Not many gods, not idols. One God that created the heavens and the earth. Very important. The next verse in the Bible is, and the earth was in chaos. And darkness was on the face of the abyss. And the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. Now, I know from the rest of the Bible that when God does something, He does it right. It doesn't start with a mess and then straighten up the mess. When God created something, He does it right. Perfect. And that's how the book of Genesis presents God's creation. A garden. Beautiful garden. And we'll get to that probably in the second uh, teaching on the first chapter of Genesis. Because of its importance. But verse 2 says, And the earth was. The word was in Hebrew is the word to be. The root to be. That which we don't have exactly that root to be, but what is comparable to the word to be. Haya. And this is in feminine, haita. Ve'ha'aretzaita. The earth was or became chaos. Tohu vavohu. And darkness was on the face of the abyss. And the Spirit of God hovered over the darkness and over the water. Actually, over the water. Yeah. And my question is, considering all modern scholarship and modern science, uh, how many years, what was before the earth became chaos? If God creates things and he creates them right, perfectly, what happened before verse 1 of Genesis and verse 2 of Genesis? I'll tell you what I think. We have physical evidence, bones, skeletons, footprints of huge animals, dinosaurs, that at one time walked on the face of this planet. Not in one place, but we have it in North America. We have it in Russia, we have it in China, we have it in South America, we have it in Africa, we have such a, in the Holy Land, in the land of Israel, there were found bones of huge elephants that we call mammoths. If you visit Jerusalem, visit the Israel Museum, you will see huge tusks of elephant tusks, but huge 
the elephant had to be huge, enormous, to have that kind of tusks that are uh, a couple of meters long. Maybe longer. I didn't measure them personally. But very long. Is it a place for the Big Bang? Is there room between verse 1 and verse 2 for the Big Bang? Is there room for one, ver, between verse 1 and verse 2 of Genesis for a period in which the earth was different? Maybe didn't have men or humanoids, but had huge animals that roamed on the face of this earth? You've got the Varia pits in Los Angeles. You've got in Germany a place where a lot of... of of dinosaur bones and ancient animal bones that don't exist today are found physically. I don't know, but I see room between the earth, the earth became chaos and God created the heavens and the earth. We are going to continue a little longer and then go on to the story of creation in a second lesson dealing with this that can be broadcast by Brad TV. This whole thing is in cooperation and partnership with Brad TV in Korea, South Korea. Verse 3 of Genesis 1 says, And God said, Let there be light. But the sun and the moon and the stars were not created until the fourth day of creation. And it's interesting that the Enuma Elish, which is a pagan document, says the gods also created the luminaries. Means the sun, the moon, and the stars. But here we have this metaphysical statement and metaphysical creation of light. God spoke light into existence. You know, in, in this next Shabbat, we will be reading uh, from Isaiah 60. And in the last verses of Isaiah 60, Isaiah the prophet, chapter 60, it says that there will be a time in which there will be no sun anymore, but God himself will be the light. Predicting, of course, a huge upheaval in the earth around the earth, pointing out already to the book of Revelation, to the end of the book of Revelation from Isaiah, the 8th century B.C. So, yes, God spoke things into existence. And uh, this element is not unique, but very special. God's word, and we're going to see, meet God's word in chapter 3 of Genesis, God's word spoke and said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And he separated, God separated between the light and the darkness. And we know how light comes to our world and how darkness comes into the world because our world spins around the sun. And when one side of the world is in darkness, the other side of the world is in light. And God made this light and day and night before the sun and the moon and the stars were created. There's a secret in here. I hope we can get to the secret further down the road when we continue studying the Torah. For now, I will be ending this lesson with the first verses of Genesis. And I hope to do a second session on this portion of the Torah of Genesis. Shalom, my name is Joseph Shulam, and I'm doing the second portion for the Torah reading of Genesis that starts in chapter 1 verse 1 and ends in chapter 6 verse 8 because it's a long portion of reading and it's one of the most important portions of reading in the whole Bible.
because it starts with the creation of the world and ends with the, with the casting out of Adam and Eve from the garden and then with God's disappointed from humanity in chapter 6 and the beginning of the story of the flood. I decided to do a double for this week and that is Genesis' second lesson that I hope to cover most of the important things in this Torah portion of reading, the first Torah portion of the year that is read. And I am in chapter 2, verse 1. God finished the work of his creation. And on the seventh day, after ending his work, he rested on the seventh day of all of his work which he had done. It's a very, very interesting and important text. First of all, the first thing that we learn from this text is that God finished the work of his creation. What does it mean for us? We're living on this earth. We're living in this galaxy with the sun and the stars and the moons. And when it says God finished the work of his creation, in other words, everything that was supposed to be created was created. In other words, the, the work of creation was the establishment of a galaxy with the sun, the moon, the stars around us. And all of nature that was supposed to be was created then in the act of creation. And the first thing that God does when he finishes that creation, he rests on the seventh day. It's very important. Does God need rest? Do the angels need rest? I don't know and I'm not sure. But obviously, God is setting a pattern. A pattern for his sake and for the sake of humanity. He has created a day in which that day is given from God himself, from heaven, for you and for me so that we can have the right to rest, so that we are not slaves of work, that we have a privilege as creation of God to be like God and to have a time of rest. This is a very, very important part of the story of creation that after God finished creating the physical world, on the seventh day, God rested. And he not only rested, but verse 3 of chapter 2 says, he blessed it, he sanctified the seventh day. He made it a special day. It's an act of creation. It's not a Jewish thing. It's not an Israeli thing. It's a thing for all of humanity. Because we are all children of Adam and Eve. So when God rested on the seventh day and commanded humanity and sanctified the seventh day to rest on the seventh day, he wasn't thinking of Israel. He wasn't thinking of the Jews. There were no Jews. Abraham was not born yet. Isaac was not born yet. Jacob was not born yet. God sanctify the seventh day for all of humanity, for all the children of Adam and Eve. Verse 4 of chapter 2 starts with a very interesting text again, a groundbreaking text. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens. Before any plant of the field was in the earth and before the herbs of the field had grown, the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground. But mist came up from the ground to water the plants, to provide the necessary humidity to make things grow. This is an opening that gives us a hint to what is going to happen further on in chapter 6 when the first rain comes and the flood comes 
on the earth. This in, in German is called ein, ein Wiederaufnahme, a, a hint of what is about to happen in the future. We have that kind of hints in, throughout the Bible, even in the New Testament. Paul is mentioned as somebody who's holding the coats of the people that are stoning Stephen, but a chapter and a half later, he becomes the star of the story. So this is the kind of situation here. It's a technical issue that appears in the Bible over and over and again, and we need to pay attention to these hints because they are a key to understanding the story. So God is giving us a hint. There is no rain in the world, only mist coming out of the ground. From the dust of the ground and breathe into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living being. Here is two stages. Stage number one, man was created. The form of man was created. But only when God breathed life into that mud statue created by God, only then the man became alive. And we know from the Greeks and from the Hebrews as well that man has a physical body and he has a living spirit and he has a part that is divine, a soul that God gave him when he put life into him. And together that makes a human being. The next news that we get from this portion of the Torah is that God made a garden. A garden in Eden. It has a geography. We don't know that geography, how, how to find it. But it's, it has a geography telling us where it is located, between which rivers. And, but we, of course, live thousands of years on this side of, of creation. We don't know the date of creation. It could have been many, many years ago, thousands and thousands of years ago, maybe more than thousands of years ago. You know, the Bible doesn't say that. Science has different theories of when the earth was created, when human beings were formed, and how they were formed. And, and these are all conjectures, scientific speculations, mainly because evidence is lacking to fulfill the picture. When science is science, right science, it doesn't contradict the Bible. But when we read the Bible, not what we receive from the churches and from the synagogues, when we read the Bible, and there is no contradiction with science either, the two dovetail one into another if we allow them to do that. So, we back in the garden now, because of lack of time, I have to jump a little bit and not go verse by verse. And in the garden, there is two trees that are forbidden for Adam and Eve to eat from. The tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And there is a snake in the garden. In the book of Revelation, that snake is identified as Satan. And uh, we are in Genesis, and I'm jumping to the book of Revelation because there that snake is identified as Satan. And who put him there in the garden? There was nothing. Everything that was created was created by God. Satan is not an independent figure. In the Bible, he is a totally dependent figure in God and he sits in God's boardroom like in the book of Job chapter 1 verse 6 or in the book of First Kings in the last chapters. Satan is there and is a part of God's creation. There is only one God and that God created both good and evil. If you don't believe me, read Isaiah chapter 45 verses 5 through 7. And you'll find out that the English translation says that God created good or perfection, shalom, and in Hebrew, ra, evil. In English, the translators that came from, you know, England, mainly in the English translation, 
translated that he created calamity. Calamity is also not ice cream. It's not uh, goods calamity. But they couldn't get themselves to write exactly, to translate exactly what the Hebrew Bible says. Ra, ontological evil. So, this is also the, the Jewish viewpoint, by the way. It's based on the text in Isaiah 45 and other texts as well that I had already mentioned. So, God put the snake there. He put Adam and Eve there in the same garden. And the snake deceived Eve. We see that repeated, this, this truth repeated in the New Testament in more than one way. In one of them is in the, in the book of Thessalonians. And uh, she was deceived, and she deceived Adam, and they sinned. What was the sin, and why was the sin so grave? It's because they, not of the eating of the fruit. It's because they believed the snake more than they believed God. They honored the snake more than they honored God. The fruit had nothing to do with it. It could have been an apple, it could have been a fig, it could have been a, a pomela, if you want, or a, a lychee. I don't know what the fruit is. Everything that everybody that says that he knows is speculating because the Bible doesn't say. But the issue is that from the beginning, in chapter 2, in verse 15, we are told that Adam and Eve were put in the garden to take care of the garden. The, the New King James says in verse 15, chapter 2, verse, and the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. The Hebrew is le'ovdah u le'shomra, means to work it and to protect it. That was the task that God gave man before men sinned. Wasn't there to sit in the garden and suntan and turn over to the front and the, to his back to make sure that his suntan is even? No, that was not the case of being in the garden. Man had to work in the garden. The word to tend in King James language was to work, to be the farmer, the, the gardener that's taking care of the garden, to, to tend and to keep it, to protect it. And men sinned, he got cast out of the garden, and he, uh, like it says, where after his sin, God said to the woman, you will bear children with pain, with suffering, and she bore children, two sons, still in the portion of Genesis here, of the reading of Genesis in every synagogue in the world. She had two sons, Cain and Abel. One was a farmer and the other one was a shepherd. This is the classical war throughout history, folks. American history will tell you the difference and the, the, the competition and the enmity that was created in the, in the 19th century and in the early 20th century between the farmers and the cowboys. That competition, that encounter between those who work the land and those who raise and tend animals is as old as history. And it's already in the beginning of the Bible, in the portion of Genesis. So these two boys, what did they want? What, what, what was their problem? Their problem was that uh, they competed with each other. And that competition caused frustration, and the frustration caused enmity. And then Abel got killed by his brother, Cain. Why? Because Abel offered meat. Animal sacrifice and Cain brought from the work of his hands vegetables. 
in Christian theology, it's because there was blood in the lamb, in the, ca in the animals that, Cain brought, that Abel brought, and there was no blood in the, in the vegetables. That's in Christian theology because there's power in the blood. But in the biblical story itself, there isn't. That's not the cause. The cause was that Abel was not able to keep himself from sin. And God warned before this event happened, you are, you are, sin is crouching at the door and you can have victory over it. The idea that sin is more powerful than our will, than our wisdom, than our soul, than our God-given ability to resist sin is wrong. Is wrong. We are not there. We are not there. The Bible says that sin is crouching at the door. That's true. That's on everybody's door. My door and your door. But that same text says you can resist it. Now, Abel got killed. He was buried by his brother. But it says that the blood of Abel screams from under the ground. Now, this is true not only for Abel. Every innocent blood that is shed by men, by the evil intentions and the disproportionate disobedience to God's word, the blood of innocent people screams from the ground until it is repented. And this is true for the millions of people that died in World War II. Not only Jews, even if we say six million Jews died in the war, killed in Nazi concentration camps, there is many more than six million people that died in the war, in the Pacific theater with the Japanese, by the Germans in the war. In World War I, already more than six million people died. So a lot of innocent blood was shed and that blood screams in need of repentance. And nations who have not repented are eventually going to pay for the innocent blood that they have shed. One more element before I uh, end this teaching. And the next week we'll go into another portion, the portion of Noah. And that is the element of Adam and Eve trying to hide from God. They sinned, they realized they sinned, and they saw their nakedness, and they hid from God, and God doesn't come to look for them. He sends somebody physical. How do I know that it's somebody physical? Because they heard the sound of God walking, walking in the garden in the cool of the evening and asking the, 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 the historical most important question for each one of us. Man, Ayeka in Hebrew, where are you? Man, where are you? It's not that God did not know when, where they are. We don't know where we are in relationship to God. When we sin, we lose the relationship, the contact, the communication with God. And therefore, that question, that the, the voice of God in Aramaic, the word of God, Mimra Deya, yeah? Dvar Adonai, the voice of God, Kol Adonai, Mit Alech Bagan, the voice of God, the word of God walking in the garden had feet because they heard him walking. That word of God is embedded and made physical in the birth of Yeshua. That the spirit of God put on flesh as the gospel of John, the first chapter says, and came to dwell among us. Now, these things are all here 
in this portion of Genesis. There's much more, but I don't want to prolong this teaching. I want you to read the text yourself and contemplate it. God bless you all and bless Brad TV for endeavoring this big project of going throughout the whole year reading the portions of the Torah from Genesis to the end of the book of Deuteronomy and sometimes also relating to the portion of the Haftarah, the reading from the prophets that accompanies these sections of the Torah. God bless you all and Shalom from Jerusalem.